Hello YouTube, this is a collection of maths problems that I recorded for a course called Problem Solving Matters. That's a collaboration between five universities including Oxford and the AMSP, the Advanced Maths Support Programme. If you're interested in more maths support provided by the AMSP, I've put a link to their website on screen here and in the description. Okay, enough chat, let's do some maths. Over to me, back in lockdown when I had much, much more hair. We're given two chords, PQ and PR, and we're told that they make an angle of theta, and we'd like to maximise the shaded area between those two chords. So when I see a new problem like this, um, when I haven't really got a way in, um, I like to imagine what would happen for particular values of theta, um, to try out special, special values and see if I can generalise from there. Um, for example, if theta were a right angle, then P, that's a right angle, would be the, the angle in a semicircle. I remember this fact from GCSE about the angle in a semicircle is a right angle. Um, and if P is a right angle in a semicircle, then QR would be the diameter. And then, given the diameter, P could be somewhere on that semicircle. Um, but I'd make the area really big by putting P as far away from the diameter as I could. And I'd put it all the way over. 90 degrees away around the circle or, or something like that and actually if you go and work out the area in that particular case for theta is 90 degrees then you can find out what the what the area would be for that particular value of theta this question was originally a multiple choice question and if you did that calculation for theta is 90 degrees then you get enough information to work out which was the right answer. We haven't given you the options for this question so that you have to work out the proper expression in terms of theta. Okay, so we've got to think about other values of theta as well, but we're going to try and learn from that um, example of what would happen for a right angle. Um, okay, so let's see if I can remember any other facts about circles. Um, here's one. I remember this fact about the angle in the centre is the angle in the centre is twice the angle on the outside for um, situations like this. I think I want to mark in the centre. I don't have a name in the question. I'm going to call it O. Um, and the angle at the centre is going to be 2 theta, twice the angle on the circumference. Um, and that's quite interesting because it means if theta is fixed, then, well, I suppose 2 theta is fixed as well. And this area over here between OR and OQ, that area is fixed. It's just something to do with 2 theta. In fact, I could work that area out. Um, so this area here is, well, it's 2 theta over 360 degrees. It's that much of a circle times pi r squared. I think the radius of the circle is 1, but pi r squared for now. Um, so that's how big the purple area is over there. And that's fixed. It's just uh, something to do with theta. I suppose uh, the only thing that I can change is I can move p around. Um, I can move p around so that uh, somewhere else on, on the circle, it's still subtending the same chord, uh, qr, so it's still going to have an angle of theta. All I want to do is I want to make this leftover shape, this kind of Star Trek logo shape. Um, I want to maximize that area. So for a given theta, P is somewhere on this um, somewhere on this arc of the circle. I want to make that area as large as I can. Okay, I think the best way to think about this is in terms of triangles, um, because that red area is just it's kind of triangle PQR minus triangle OQR. Um, triangle OQR is fixed. It's part of this purple region that's a fixed area. Um, so I can make this red shaded area, the Star Trek logo bit, um, I can make that big just by making triangle PQR as big as possible. Okay, so we're looking for the biggest possible triangle. And the inspiration for this is to remember back in the right angle case, where we try to move that point as far away from the diameter as possible. Well, here we've got a triangle with a fixed base, um, QR, if I think of that as the base of my triangle. Um, and I want to maximise its height so that I maximise its area. Um, and I do that if I put P as far away on the circle as I can from that line. When that happens, then the line PO 
will meet QR at a right angle. Everything will be nice and symmetric. P will be on the, the other side of the circle to the midpoint of QR. I know we've got a really nice setup. Um, I just need to find the area of that red Star Trek logo. Okay, um, my plan for this is I'm gonna split it into these two, two triangles, um, OPR and OPQ. Um, because those are similar triangles. They're isosceles triangles as well, so it's quite nice to find their area. Okay, so there's a triangle over here that's got an angle at the top of theta over 2. Everything's nice and symmetric. It's isosceles, so this is also theta over 2 over here. Um, and it's got an angle here that I'm going to call x. Uh, my plan for finding the area of this triangle is to do 1 half um, bc sine a, so use the um, use the sine form of the area of a triangle. Uh, let's think a little bit. Um, x is going to be well, some of the angles in a triangle is 180 degrees, so x is going to be 180 degrees minus two lots of theta over two is theta. Okay, and actually sine of 180 degrees minus theta is the same thing as sine of theta. And as well as this triangle, I've got an identical one on the other side. So I want two of those. That's going to cancel out the half. Um, put it all together, and I get my final answer for the area as theta over 180 degrees times pi. That's from the purple region. Plus two lots of half of 1 times 1 times sine theta. This is my final answer. Theta measured in degrees divided by 180 degrees times pi plus sine theta. I think the original map question was asked... Uh, back in the days when we assumed everybody knew radians, uh, so it was asked in terms of radians. In terms of radians, uh, this formula is even nicer because this, this term simplifies a little bit. Um, these days we don't assume you've seen radians, um, so we'd give the answer in terms of degrees. Um, but that's my final answer for the maximum possible area, the biggest triangle plus a fixed region. We've been given the equation for the cubic and we've been asked to find a condition on its coefficients so that it's got exactly two turning points. My plan for this is to find its turning points and then count how many I've got. Uh, let's try that. So let's do dy by x, uh, that's 3x squared plus 2ax plus b, and for a turning point I want that to be zero. So I've got this quadratic equation for turning points. For turning points. Sorry about the handwriting. Um, okay, so this has got exactly two roots when the discriminant of this quadratic is positive. Uh, the discriminant here is b squared, I suppose, minus 4ac, where a isn't a, b isn't b, and c isn't c, but I want this to be positive to have exactly two roots. Okay, I think I can simplify this a little bit by dividing through by 4 to say something like a squared bigger than 3b, or something like that. But that's my condition in terms of a, b, and c to have two turning points. I suppose it doesn't involve c at all. That makes sense, I suppose, if you look back at the cubic, because changing c just moves this cubic up and down and won't change how many turning points it's got. Um, and I think it's worth saying that this, this does count as a condition in a, b, and c, even though c doesn't appear in it. Um, okay, so this is what we were looking for. Great, next part of the question. Here we go. Um, the next part asks us for the distance between the two turning points, the x-coordinates of those turning points. Um, so here I'm going to take the quadratic that I've got for its turning points, and I'm going to write down the two roots. Oh, I suppose I'm starting from this quadratic equation. Uh, the roots are at minus 2a plus or minus uh, 4a squared minus 12b over 6. I think I can simplify down to minus a plus or minus a squared minus 3b over 3. A uh, good check here is that the discriminant turns up again inside this square root, so I'm checking that I've got uh, a sensible thing for the discriminant. And yeah, when a squared is bigger than 3b, this term inside the square root is positive. That's good news. Um, and the distant difference between the two roots, I've got expressions for x1 and x2, and so x2 take away x1 is going to be 2 times this part here, which is root a squared minus 3b. Okay, 
fantastic. And that's the distance between x2 and x1. What next? Ah, so next we translate this graph so that one of the turning points is at the origin. And we're, say, we're going to say g of x is the equation for the new cubic we get when we do that. I think it's helpful to pause here and think about what changes and what stays the same when we do that translation. Um, it'd be very easy to plug in um, a general translation, left some number of units and up some number of units. We'd have a couple of variables in there. The algebra gets quite messy very quickly. Um, let's think about what stays the same and what changes. So when I do a translation, we talked about up and down translations. Um, that just changes this coefficient on the end. Um, left and right coefficients would be a bit like plugging in f of x minus some number, uh, x minus t, let's say, for some horizontal translation. Um, when we do that, we'll plug in x minus t into these terms, but the coefficient of x cubed will still be 1, because the only x cubed term in this will come from x minus t cubed. So we'll x minus t cubed at the front, and that has x cubed coefficient of just x cubed. So that's something that stays the same, the first coefficient of uh, the coefficient of x cubed stays the same when we do this translation. Something else that change, stays the same is the distance between the turning points, or the difference, distance between the x coordinates to the turning points. Um, and I've thought of that because it was the thing in the previous part of the question, and because I was thinking about this geometrically as well. Uh, as well as the algebra of what happens when you plug in that translation, I like to think about uh, the geometry of the problem, what happens to the shape when you move it around. And as you move the shape around, the distance between those two points um, isn't going to change. OK, so I've got two things that are going to stay the same. This coefficient of x cubed is going to be the same afterwards. Um, and the distance between the turning points is going to be the same. What else do I know about g of x, the equation for y equals g of x? Well, I know that it's got this new curve has a turning point at the origin, which means it's got, uh, it goes through the origin, and it's got zero derivative at the origin. So I think that means that the cubic for g of x has that quite a particular form. I think the cubic for g of x has to go, g of x is, we know it starts x cubed. Um, I don't know the next term, so I'm going to put plus rx squared. And then I think it hasn't got an x term or a, or a constant on the end because g of x, because g of x at 0 is 0, and because the derivative of g is 0 at 0. OK, so those two things are both 0, so both those coefficients disappear, and all I need to work out is this coefficient of x squared. I haven't yet used my fact that the distance between the turning points is 2 thirds of root a squared minus 3b, uh, so I'm going to use that now. Let's find the turning points for g. So the turning points for g happen when 3x squared plus 2rx is 0. Uh, one, of those, one of those solutions is x is 0, and the other one is x is minus 2 thirds r. Now, the distance between those is nine, minus 2 thirds r. So I want minus 2 thirds r to be 2 thirds root a squared minus 3b, the distance that we found before. OK. If that's the case, then r is minus a squared minus root a squared minus 3b, and I've got my final expression for g as g is x cubed minus root a squared minus 3b x squared. Fantastic. And I could simplify that by pulling out a factor of x squared, but I don't really want to. Um, I think the question has a factor of x squared in it, but I'm about to integrate this, so I'd like to keep those terms separate. OK, and in fact, that's the next part of the question. The uh, next part of the question wants us to work out uh, the area enclosed by the x-axis and the graph. Let's do a quick sketch of the graph. Um, so we know it's got a repeated root at 0, and it looks like it's got another root over somewhere else, another root when well, I suppose x is equal to this positive thing over here. Um, so I think the graph is going to look like this, and then r is going to be this region in here. Okay, always nice to have a little sketch. Oh. Okay, so I want to find out that area. I'm going to need to integrate g of x between 0 and 
that root. Um, so the root there is a squared minus 3b. We've got to integrate some polynomials. And I think if we integrate those polynomials, you get a squared minus 3b squared over 4 minus a squared minus 3b squared over 3, which is just a squared minus 3b squared over 12 with a minus sign. Um, okay, so if R is positive, uh, if, sorry, if A and B are rational, then A squared minus 3B is rational, so A squared minus 3B is some other rational number, and this thing for the area is rational as well. I've remembered that areas are positive, so I should have mod signs around here, mod signs around here, and then that kills off the minus sign. Doesn't affect the, the discussion of whether it's rational or not, uh, just areas are supposed to be positive. I could have guessed that from my sketch that was under the, under the curve, so I should put a minus sign in. Right, okay, but if A and B are rational, then this thing's obviously rational, well, maybe not obviously, but this thing's definitely rational. Okay, is it possible for R, that's this number, to be, final part here, to be a non-zero rational number when A and B are both irrational? So I noticed that my stomach sank a bit because that sounds really complicated. Um, it turns out that just by experimenting with different values of a and b, or, or experimenting with different values that we want r to be, we can force this to be basically any non-zero rational number that we like. Uh, I'm going to choose um, to try and find a solution with r1. So is there a solution with r equals 1? And that would happen if a squared minus 3b squared was exactly 12 which would happen okay if a and b are rational numbers, also happens quite a few other ways. Um, for example, I would want a squared minus 3b to be root 12. Um, I want my algebra to be not too horrible, so I'm going to say maybe, maybe we'll take b is also root 12, and then you see I've got a squared is 4 root 12. Now, I know that root 12 is an irrational number, and I know that then I can move the 3b over without messing up the algebra too much. You got this nice simple 4 root 12. So a, I could have maybe a is 2 square root of square root of 12. And I suppose there's a step to say I should probably check that this is irrational, this is irrational, and this is, I mean, this is definitely rational. 1 is an extremely rational number, if anything can be extremely rational. Um, but there is lots of other choices as well for values of a and b. Uh, is it possible for r to be non-zero rational num number? Yes, even with a and b both irrational numbers. We've been given the values of log base 10 of 5, log base 10 of 6, and log base 10 of 7 to some huge number of decimal places, and we're asked to work out log base 10 of 2, 3, and 9. Um, so, the first thing I think of when I see 2 and a 10 in the same problem, and some 5, 6, and 7 up here is um, 2 times 5 is equal to 10, 2 is one of the factors of 10, I'd like to try and exploit that fact. My plan is to just write down true statements involving logarithms until I get something that looks like I can make progress with this question. Okay, um, so 2 times 5 is 10, that means 2 is uh, 10 over 5. And again, I have no idea if this is making progress or not, but at least it's true. And sometimes writing down true statements is all I can do. Uh, in this case, I can now start using some logarithm facts to say this is log 10 of 10 minus log base 10 of 5. And this is looking really good now, because this is now 1 minus log base 10 of 5. Uh, so now I've got a plan. I need to take this first number I've been given, log 10 of 5, and do 1 minus that number. Okay, um, let's see if I can do that. Here we go. I'm not the best at doing subtraction. Let's see if I can get this one right. So I'm going to do 30102999957, I guess. And it's asked for this to seven decimal places. Um, so to seven decimal places, that's uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So I need to put 300 because I'm running up this 95 to seven decimal places. Okay, great. So use some facts about logarithms, and then do some subtraction, which was harder than it should have been, really. Um, okay, so next up we want to do log base 10 of 6, no, log base 10 of 3, 
Um, my suspicion here is that three times two is six. I've got this idea that I just used in the question um, to rewrite the number inside the logarithm as some ratio. I should try and exploit that again. Um, so here I'm already thinking, let's try and get lucky with the same trick again and write three as six over two. Um, and then I can use that this is log 10 of six, which is this number up here, minus log 10 of two, which is the number we just worked out. Okay, quick note on decimal places and subtraction. Um, it's quite tempting to take the expression for log 10 of six to seven decimal places and subtract the expression that I just found to seven decimal places. But I'm a bit nervous about doing that because when you subtract with error mar margins of error, the margins of error always add, they get, they get larger, even if you're doing subtraction. And that means that if I'm subtracting two numbers that are both true to seven decimal places, I'm not sure I'm going to get a number that's correct to seven decimal places um, out at the end. All of that is me justifying I'm going to do subtraction using an extra extra digit of the numbers just to make sure that I don't have rounding errors. Okay, maybe I'm being too cautious. Maybe this question's been written so that uh, you can get away with just using the seven digit expressions for each of these. Okay, so I need to write out 0 0.778151, that's six digits, uh, Two five, and I need to subtract from that 0 0.30102, and I'm going to go to eight digits. So I'm going to use three of these. Actually, the three rounding this up, I get 3000 anyway. So if I do that subtraction, I get 2177 0.4771212125, which when I round it up to seven decimal places is going to be, or oh, round it. Uh, yeah, round it up to seven decimal places, it's going to be 0 0.4771213 to seven decimal places. Okay, fantastic. So now I've got log base 10 of 2 and I've got log base 10 of 3. One more to do, um, I'm going to need to work out log base 10 of 9. And here my plan is to use one more rule of logarithms. That 9 is 3 squared, so this is going to be 2 times log base 10 of 3. Uh, so I need to take the previous thing that I just worked out, I'm going to take it to 8 decimal places, and I need to double it. Um, so if I double that number, I get 0 0.894954, carry the, oh goodness me, 24250 to 8 decimal places. So I can ignore this 0 when I go to to this, this, to seven decimal places. Okay, put in an extra decimal place and it turned out not to matter. Okay, a lot of calculations so far. Right, what have we got? We found log base 10 of two, three, and nine. We've already got five, six, and seven. I suppose an interesting side question. We've almost worked out log base 10 of all of the small numbers. We're missing, I suppose, log base 10 of four and eight, um, but I've got a plan for those. I could, I could work out log base 10 of four. That's two times log base 10 of two. Um, log base 10 of 8 is 3 times log base 10 of 2. Uh, I'm saying this now because it turns out that I need those for the next part of the question. Um, so a bit cheekily, I'm going to work out those approximations um, just to a couple of decimal places, and I'll put those on the screen now um, for the approximations for log base 10 of 4 and 8, which I've just worked out in a similar way to the way I just worked out log base 10 of 9. Turns out we need them for the next part of the question. I guess there's an interesting side question of how many facts do you need to be told before you can work out all of the other log base n of small numbers up to n? So here we can work out all of the log base 10 numbers given just three bits of information. Could we do it with just two bits of information? What if we were doing log base something else? I have no idea what the answer to that question is. Might be too hard. Maybe have a think about that. Okay, right, we need to do the next part of this question now, which I've promised will involve log base 10 of four and eight as well. Okay. Um, so the next part of this question wants us to work out an approximation for some numbers, uh, five to the hundred to start off with. Um, so here we've got five to the 100. We'd like to know what the first digit is. In fact, we'd like to bound it between two absolutely huge numbers. Um, here's my plan. I'm going to take logarithms and use the approximations from the first part. The question quite helpfully has that text in it. Um, so maybe that wasn't my idea so much as just following the instructions of the question. So I'm gonna take a logarithm and that's gonna be 100 log base 10 of 5, which I know from the previous part 
is equal to 69.897.00043. Okay, so what have I got here? Um, I've got a number that's 69 and a bit. And that little bit is going to be quite important um, because my plan is to say that this is, well, it's bigger than 69, but I can actually bigger, better than that. It's bigger than 69 plus, and then I've got this expression from log 7 for log 7 in the question, 0.84. Um, let's put 0.846 or something, which is bigger than 69 plus log base 10 of 7. And be very careful to bound it between two extra two extra things. Maybe that's a step too many. Um, this is also less than 69 plus, um, and then I want to say it's less than log 8, so I need to use my log 8 expression, which is about 0 0.9, um, 0 0.9, which is 69 plus log base 10 of 8. Okay, so I've bounded this leftover bit between two of the numbers I had before, and I'm doing that because I want to put bounds on, on this number 5 to the power of 100. I'm expecting to then take powers of 10 of everything, you see. Um, so if I take powers of 10 off to the left, yeah, 5 to the 100, all these logarithms will base 10 if I forget to write some 10s in some places. Um, 5 to the 100 is bigger than 10 to the 69 plus 0.846, so this is 69 plus log base 10 of 7, and it's less than 10 to the 69 plus log base 10 of 8. Um, but these numbers are 7 times 10 to the 69, and 8 times 10 to the 69. Okay, that's the inequalities we're asked to find. Um, so I think some of my um, some of my choices here were inspired by being told what to bound 5 to the 100 by. Um, in general, I try and work out how big this leftover decimal part of the number was um, to work out what numbers I could get away with putting over here, um, because those numbers are going to turn up over here. Okay, um, so 5 to the 100 is somewhere between... I don't know what that number's called, uh, 7 times 10 to the 69 and 8 times 10 to the 69. Um, I think that means that the first digit has to be a 7, um, because you're 7 followed by 69 digits, you're not as big as 8 followed by 69 zeros, so you start with a 7. Okay, I'd like to do exactly this plan for the remaining part of the question, which asks about some more numbers, 6 to the 1000, 4 to the 10,000, and 2 to the 100,000. Um, here we go. So let's start another bit of paper. Let's do, um, let's do the same plan again. So I want to take logarithm of this again. Logarithm base 10 of 6 to the 1,000 is going to be 1,000 times log base 10 of 6. Um, and that is using the expression for log base 10 of 6 that we had. Um, whew, well, so I want to multiply by 1,000. So that's three places along, so I'm going to get 778.1512, and then I don't really care about all the rest of these digits. Okay, so 778 and a little bit, uh, and crucially, I'd like to compare that little bit to the, um, to the logarithms that I have before. Okay, uh, but in particular, I suppose this is less than 778 points um, 3, which is 3i or something, which is the expression for uh, log 2 that we had before. I'm writing it like this so that I can say that this is, uh, this is roughly equal to 778 plus log base 10 of 2, um, which is interesting because it means that this number, 6 to the 1000, is less than 10 to the 778, some huge number of zeros, times 2. Um, but it's also bigger than 10 to the 778, just because this little leftover bit up here means that this number's bigger than 778. Um, I think that means that its first digit has to be a 1, because it's bigger than 1 778 trillion, um, but it's not as big as 2 778 trillions. Okay, first digit 1. Right, good. Okay, same plan for the other two. Um, so I've got log base 10 of 4 times uh, 4 to the power of 10,000. Uh, which is going to be 10,000 log base 10 of 4, which is, and now I need a really long expression for log base 10 of 4, so I'm going to write that out as 10,000 times, and I'm going to need uh, to double the expression I have for log 2, which is going to be 0.602 600, more or less. 
Uh, when I multiply that out by 10,000, I'm going to move four places along. <laughs> so I get 6020, this number's huge, 0. 0.600, and so on. Okay, so same plan again. I've got a huge integer part, and then I've got some leftover part that's going to indicate what the first digit of this massive number is. Um, and this is uh, very close to log base 10 of 4, isn't it? In fact, it's slightly smaller than this, which would be 6,020 6, plus log base 10 of 4. Very slightly smaller. Um, I think this means that the first digit is, is 3. And you can be more precise with that argument by checking that this decimal part is bigger than log base 10 of 3 that we had before. One left, um, another piece of paper. Um, so last one, it's the absolutely massive number of 2 to the 100,000. So I'm going to do log again, and I need 100,000 of these. That's log base 10 of 2, so I need to take my expression for log 2 and multiply it by 100,000. So that's going to be 30102. I suppose, 0 0.99957 and so on. Um, this is so close to being 30103, by the way. I mean, in particular, it's bigger than 30102 point, and then whatever my expression was for log base 10 of 9, which started like 99542 uh, or something. Uh, so this is bigger than this. So that means that this, this, this final massive number, it's bigger than... 9 times 10 to the 30102, um, but not as big as 10 to the 30103, quite, not quite as big as 10 to the 30103. Um, so that means that its first digit, I think, must be a 9. Okay, same plan for each of those, slightly uh, different execution just by comparing the numbers together, but following the instructions of the question, we've compared the logarithms for these numbers. Um, I think it's quite nice that you can, just by knowing small um, logarithms, you can tell what number um, big big numbers are going to, big big powers are going to start with. Um, you might have seen a similar trick for uh, looking at what numbers these are going to end with by looking at patterns in powers of numbers. Um, but as far as I know, uh, this is the best way of finding what number, uh, what digit huge numbers start with. So we've got this particular cubic y equals kx cubed minus k plus 1x squared plus 2 minus kx minus k. And we'd like to know whether that has a turning point that's a minimum when x equals 1. Seems quite unlikely, but let's give it a go. I think the only way to approach this is to try and find where the turning points are for, gen for general k, uh, and then see if that gives us some conditions on possible values of k so that we get a turning point that's a minimum when x is 1. Um, okay, let's try and do that calculation. So we'll need to find the gradient to y by x. It's going to be 3kx squared minus 2k plus 1x plus 2 minus k. We're particularly interested in what happens at x equals 1. So I'm going to plug in 1. Uh, this is do y by x. It's going to be 3k minus 2k plus 1 plus 2 minus k. Uh, and something a bit magic happens when I try and simplify this. Um, everything cancels out. Uh, this 1 multiplied by 2 cancels with this 2, uh, and I get 0. So this is a turning point at x equals 1 for any value of k, which is pretty exciting. Um, seems quite unlikely, but it's happened. Um, do y by dx is 0 for all values of k for this family of cubics. We're not done yet, though, because we want this to be a minimum. And to check whether it's a minimum or not, I need to look for the second derivative. So I need to work out the second derivative. Uh, so from here, I'm going to work out the second derivative. Uh, that's 6kx minus 2k plus 1. And I want that to be positive so that I get a minimum. Um, let's do some simplifying. Um, so we want this to be positive at x equals 1 for a minimum at x equals 1. Uh, so let's plug in x equals 1, and we get this. We want 6k minus 2k plus 1. We want that to be positive. Uh, and I can rearrange that a bit to say k has to be bigger than 1 half, which is option C. So this question is a little bit unusual because 
perhaps you're used to finding the turning points of a curve or a cubic, um, but this question asks it the other way round. It asks you, given these properties about the cubic, tell me about the coefficients in the cubic, kind of working backwards. Um, but the actual algebra you do is just about the same.